And then there was a second high-level Oath Keeper who is also on the right side of that perimeter, the lawful side. He places 10 calls to one uh, Oath Keeper and a couple calls to another. So they are in communication. All I can imagine is that the government just doesn't think it yet has the proof it needs to, to go that extra step. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, January 7th, 2022. Roger Parloff, Lawfare Senior Editor, has a long piece out on Lawfare entitled The Conspirators, The Proud Boys and Oath Keepers on January 6th. It is an examination of the major conspiracy indictments flowing from the January 6th investigation. Both sets of indictments focus on far-right militia organizations that participated in the attack. One set on the group called the Oath Keepers, the other on a group called the Proud Boys. In the article, Parloff argues that the Proud Boys in particular played a pivotal role in the insurrection of January 6th, being the first to commit violence, the first to actually breach the Capitol barricades, and the first to destroy property. He joined me in the Virtual Jungle Studio to talk about the indictments, why these cases are significant, what they suggest about the dynamics of January 6th, and why there are so few people charged with conspiracy among the hundreds who are charged in connection with the day's events. It's the Lawfare Podcast, January 7th, Roger Parloff on The Conspirators. So Roger, this is a quite long piece that you've written about Oath Keepers and Proud Boys in the conspiracy indictments of of groups of them. And I want you to start by just describing why you took on this project and why the Oath Keeper and Proud Boy indictments are important. Yeah, I thought they were uh, some of the most interesting cases that have been brought. There have only been 40 individuals out of the 700 and five or so that have been charged with federal crime so far that are charged with conspiracy. And almost uh, about 35, at least 35 of those are either Oath Keepers or Proud Boys. These are interesting cases. The, uh, the Oath Keepers case uh, has become sort of emblematic of the insurrection. And the Proud Boys cases are actually remarkably important to what happened, or at least I should say, obviously, this is based on the accusations of the indictments, because I, I think there's strong evidence that the Proud Boys played a, a crucial role in fomenting and executing the attack and with planning in advance. Those are the accusations and, and the evidence uh, the government is alleging uh, sounds strong, assuming they can prove it. So why does it matter, this number 40 people who have been charged with conspiracy, why does the number of people who've been charged with conspiracy as opposed to everything from trespassing to obstructing a government proceeding to assaulting a cop, why is the number of people who've been charged with conspiracy interesting? I think that what it means is that these people planned and coordinated in advance with the goal of committing crimes on that day. So this was not spontaneous on their part. And so I think that makes the cases interesting and important. And of course, I think it's also interesting that even though there's so few of them, it sounds like at least the Proud Boys played a remarkable role. In, in the whole event, even though it's a, a small number. So this is a, a an interesting sort of underlying theory of your article that if you're looking for the pre-planning for the, the organization of the riot or insurrection, 
the conspiracy cases play a particularly important role because the nature of conspiracy is that they are not spontaneous responses to you know what happened on the ellipse or speeches that people made and i guess i, I want to start by testing that a little bit is it fair to say that taking the federal government's allegations as fact for purposes of this conversation these are the people that the government alleges organized the insurrection as opposed to merely participated in it? I would say that that is true with respect to the Proud Boys. I, I think that the Oath Keepers is, a, is a, a fuzzier one. The Oath Keepers certainly planned and prepared for violence. They seem to have hoped that the president would give them President Trump would give them a signal that he would, in essence, you know, in in their words, invoke the Insurrection Act or call them up as militia in order to impose something like martial law. They were hoping that he would do that. They had stored an arsenal across the river in uh, the Comfort Inn in Boston, Virginia, allegedly. And so they were ready. It's not so clear to me that they would have had decided in advance to attack the Capitol, to, to enter it. They don't, in fact, enter it until after the breach has occurred on the western side of the Capitol, which is really the attack that's spearheaded by Proud Boys, according to the government indictments. So if that's a summary of the Oath Keepers side, what is a brief summary of the Proud Boys conspiracy look like? Yeah, there, and and I should also give credit here to the Wall Street Journal, which on January 26th of 2021 had already done a remarkable analysis that obviously the government prosecutions are drawing upon. They did a lot of analysis of video, publicly available video, and, and noticed this apparent uh, role that uh, the, the Proud Boys were playing. But anyway, allegedly on the morning, they don't bother to go to the Ellipse. They go to the Washington Monument at 10 a.m. And then they move to uh, a lawn east of the Capitol at about 1130. And there's about 100 of them at that point. And then... Trump's speech has begun, uh, begins around, around noon, and they begin uh, marching over uh, uh, along the northern edge, and they come to a spot called the Peace Monument, which is uh, just northwest of the Capitol. It's sort of where Pennsylvania Avenue hits at dead ends into the Capitol grounds. And there, they gather there at 1245. That's 15 minutes before the joint session is gaveled into session. And that is where there is a thin line of police, about you know five or six officers behind some bike rack barriers, barricades end to end. That's where uh, at 1253, the first barricades will be toppled. And then something unusual happens, which the journal noticed, uh, which is on camera, which is that well, one guy, a guy named, we now know his name is Ryan Samsel, who does not appear to be a proud boy, but he goes up and he has a conversation with an important proud boy named Joe Biggs. And uh, right after that conversation, Samsel and a second man, they enter the uh, restricted area and they stride up to right up to the officers and begin to speak with them belligerently. Samso actually takes off his uh, jacket and he turns his uh, baseball cap around. And then the two of them begin to lift and jostle the uh, bike racks and topple them over. Uh, one of the uh, police officers, a woman, uh, it actually strikes her head on the uh, steps and uh, an hour later, she goes to the emergency room with a concussion. But that is when the uh, barricades apparently are first toppled and a stream of people begin to flow in. And that includes many, many Proud Boys, allegedly. And uh, incidentally, 
Apparently, SAMHSA, and this was first reported by Alan Foyer of the New York Times, SAMHSA has apparently told the FBI that Biggs, in fact, did sort of put him up to this uh, in that conversation. Biggs, Biggs' lawyer has denied this and says it's a fiction, it's a ridiculous. Anyway, it, it, the crowd, the mob, flows down this a diagonal walkway, which stretches, it's a, it's like a walkway that's a continuation of Pennsylvania Avenue and just leads directly to the West Capitol steps. They encounter a second line of police barricade, which uh, various government indictments or criminal complaints allege that at least four Proud Boys were personally involved in removing. And then for a period, there is a, a impasse there at the base And then eventually uh, a proud boy named Dan Milkshake Scott, allegedly, is one of the first to confront the police violently there. And uh, then uh, the, the, the mob is able to begin to go up the steps under the inaugural scaffolding. They reach the top. There are several proud boys up there, including Dominic Pizzola. He has uh, stolen a riot shield from a police officer. He breaks out the first window uh, while a second rioter uh, breaks out the pane next to it. Pozzola allegedly uses the riot shield. Uh, another rioter uses a wooden plank. And then a different man go is the first to actually hop through. But very soon thereafter, Pozzola uh, and a second man go through. And then uh, somebody forces open the door next to that door, and at least six Proud Boys uh, rush in uh, among the first, within the first two minutes after the breach. So is it fair in your judgment to say that if we take the government allegations through these 700 indictments seriously, the insurrection on January 6th does not happen without the Proud Boys? It seems conceivable. It seems conceivable. I know that's a strange thing to say. They are a tiny percentage of the rioters. And and, uh, a couple of the Proud Boys have also said in, in afterwards that, you know, one of their objectives was to rile up the normies. But it does seem possible that they really played these crucial roles. Now, it's possible, I'm understating, you know, there are a lot of people that aren't called conspirators because they didn't conspire, they didn't coordinate with anybody. There were plainly a lot of people that showed up that day that wanted violence. They were dressed for violence and they expected violence. So that's not a conspirator and it is somebody that's planning. And and just to be clear, it's not a conspirator because the person isn't doesn't have an agreement with anybody. He's just there preparing for violence himself, right? Exactly. He, you know, a lot of people read stuff online suggesting that there would be that this will, uh, of course, the president had said this will be wild, but there were, you know, various other websites where, where people could hear that it was going to be wild. So, but yeah, there's nobody no other individual that they were planning this with other than these anonymous figures on the internet. It takes two to tango and it takes at least two to conspiracy. Exactly. All right. So if we accept that the Proud Boys were at least a pointy end of the spear and maybe the pointy end of the spear, and we're thinking about accountability for 1-6, it raises the question of who was directing the Proud Boys. And so I want to start this with a, the question of what are the, other than that Donald Trump, you know, famously said Proud Boys stand by and stand back uh, a few months earlier, what is the evidence that the government is putting forward, if any, that the political leadership was in any sense directing the Proud Boys. In these indictments, I don't see any specific allegation that Trump or, you know, a political figure like that was directing them. The head of the Proud Boys at the time, the chairman, Enrique Tarrio, 
has not been indicted and he was not present in D.C. as it turns out. Uh, He arrived there January 4th. He was arrested for earlier violence that had occurred at a Stop the Steal rally in December. And as a condition of release on January 5th, he had to leave D.C. So he has not been charged, but his statements are referred to in in the indictments. And he had given them unusual instructions uh, on December 29th, something to the effect that uh, they should show up here without uh, no colors. Uh, They were not supposed to wear the usual black and yellow that uh, Proud Boys traditionally wear. They were supposed to basically blend in with the crowd. And uh, there were other instructions about sort of acting furtively and in, in small teams. And then, and then there was additional evidence of, of them uh, allegedly uh, forming a, uh, a new leadership group called the Ministry of Self-Defense. And it had a communications channel uh, on Telegram with about six people in charge. And so there, there is this, this sort of evidence of conspiracy beforehand and planning. So should we understand the Proud Boys here as an independent militia force that made a decision to storm the Capitol and bring a lot of normies with them and were effective in that? Or should we assume that there is maybe some political leadership behind it? Or are they just taking cues how independently of the former president's will should we assume them to be acting? Well, as far as the uh, government accusations go, the government, you know how this works, they don't need to go there to prove the crime, and so they don't go there. So, so and I, all I have to go by are these indictments. It does look like they're picking up clues on, on what needs to take place, what Trump wants to take place, but also from all of these conspiratorial voices, other voices in Alex Jones and Roger Stone and the the, the whole big lie context, the, the assumption is not just that the election was stolen, but also that Biden is evil incarnate, that he is a Chinese communist puppet, that he is communism and socialism embodied. It's, it's hard to say uh, whether they took matters into their own hands or, or, or what. The government doesn't go there. Yeah. So, I, I mean, one of the things that the Justice Department has gotten a lot of criticism for over the last year is that they are aggressively indicting individuals who participated but they are not going after political leadership, whether it's, you know, Mo Brooks or people who are alleged to have, you know, sort of congressmen who have expressed sympathy with or, or you know, raised their fists in salute of the protesters or whether it's the former president himself. But it seems to me that what you're describing and with the caveat that the government wouldn't make allegations that it didn't need to. So we have to take that as part of the background here, that that one possible explanation for that is that the Proud Boys were conspiring among themselves and they weren't taking cues from Trump, but that they weren't actually conspiring with Steve Bannon or Mark Meadows or, you know, people in that war room that has gotten so much attention. And so I'm, I'm wondering whether from a, from a prosecutorial perspective, we should read these indictments as, uh, you know, not exculpatory with respect to the political leadership, but, you know, boy, if there were unindicted co-conspirators who were in the White House or in the Trump campaign or in you know, in direct communication with the president, there would be allegations about that here. If I were a Trump defender, I would say, hey, look, it looks like what you've got here is a conspiracy of Proud Boys, not a conspiracy of of the president. 
Well, I just can't go beyond what is in the indictment so far, and and we don't see a connection, a direct connection yet, or a, I should say a direct connection period. Now, there's hopefully the select committee will gather more and more in, in, information, but whether it ever connects to the Proud Boys, I, I, I have no idea. All right, so let's talk about the Oath Keepers. The Oath Keepers, as you describe, are a little bit more ambiguous in their planning for violence versus planning to be on call for Trump should he invoke the Insurrection Act or whatever that means. What are your impressions of the sort of macro import of the Oath Keeper indictment? Well, there are tantalizing aspects of it. For one thing, they're they're performing some semi-official roles at many of these rallies, including the ones on January 5th and 6th. Some of them are performing security guard type roles, which of course, I mean, when you really think about what they are and, and how extreme and how paranoid that in itself is a a sort of a reckless thing to to I mean it's not a criminal thing but it's a reckless thing to to hire this group but uh, six of them of course were protecting Roger Stone on uh, the fifth and the sixth and uh, one had uh, another one had a VIP at least one had a VIP pass to protect um, the main rally at the ellipse and just to be clear when you say it was a reckless act to hire them. This reminds me of the Rolling Stones. Yeah, at Altamont, yes. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Who hired them? Uh, you know, that's the, what, the way it looks like is uh, it looks like Rhodes, Stuart Rhodes, the founder of the uh, Oath Keepers, who is also not charged. It sounds like, at least with respect to Watkins and with another uh, Oath Keeper who isn't charged, uh, that he is the one that would hire them. And then who hired uh, Rhodes, we don't know. And Rhodes, I should say, yes, he he was never charged. He was present in D.C. He appears to have always stayed on the right side, the lawful side of the perimeter fencing, demarking the uh, restricted grounds. So you note that in the piece, but I don't understand why that would protect him from indictment, honestly. What you've described in the piece is a, a certain level of organization and planning in which he and his people eventually decide to go in, and his people do go in. Why does the fact that he allowed others to do it for him insulate him? I, it's a very good question. I don't think, in fact, I, I think some of the other defendant oath keepers have asked that question. Does the government plan to charge him? Because they would like to know. It is alleged that he was in contact with other oath keepers through a leadership channel, encrypted channel on Signal. He did make phone calls to certain oath keepers during these events. And then there was a second high-level Oath Keeper who's called Person 10 and has been identified as Michael Simmons, who is also on the right side of that perimeter, the lawful side, but is uh, he, he places 10 calls to one uh, Oath Keeper and a couple calls to another. So they are in communication. All I can imagine is that the government just doesn't think it yet has the proof it needs to to go that extra step. He seems to be mentioned. He seems to be described as an unindicted co-conspirator. Uh, both of them, person one and person ten, being Rhodes and and Simmons. What about Roger Stone? So the uh, Roger Stone is at the time in a hotel room. On the other hand, he's substantially engaged with the Oath Keepers throughout this entire period, right? Yeah, he has he actually has, you know, close ties to both Proud Boys and Oath Keepers. But uh the Oath Keepers are protecting him uh on January 5th and 6th. He does he gives some fiery speeches on January 5th. 
He says he will be with the crowd tomorrow, January 6th, shoulder to shoulder. And he is actually scheduled to speak, at least according to a website called wildprotest.com. He's scheduled to speak at a protest that Ali Alexander has apparently set up just east of the Capitol, uh, and it, which is supposed to follow the main event at the Ellipse. So it sounds like the events are set up to draw people from the Ellipse to this later event at the Capitol itself. And uh, he is listed as one of the speakers there. But he never does leave his hotel on January 6th. And he recently told Tucker Carlson that uh, he had an intuition, uh, decided not to, that maybe it was a signal from God, but uh, he did not uh, go. And so he was nowhere near the violence and he had nothing to do with it. And yet he is sort of the closest thing we have to a direct connection between these two groups and the political leadership. Is that fair? I think it is. It's not the sort of thing prosecutors can act on, but yeah, uh, that's right. And there's one other thing to say about Roger Stone, which is that it's sort of incredible. If you go back to July 2016, 2016 now, this is before Trump's first election against Hillary Clinton, It appears that Stone thought that he was going to lose that election. And he appears on a show, uh, the Milo Yiannopoulos show sponsored by Breitbart. And he sort of lays out a template that basically leads to insurrection. And it begins with allegations of election fraud and of voting fraud, voting machine fraud. At the time, they're talking about Diebold. But they're talking about voting machine fraud. Well, why not? He says, he actually says, you know, a a voting machine is type of computer. Who's to say that uh, they can't be rigged? I think Trump should begin talking about fraud, talking about it constantly and saying that if he doesn't win, it can only be fraud. And if he does not win, there will be a uh, constitutional crisis. People just won't accept Hillary's victory. And he uses... uh, I I don't want to, his exact words are careful there. He does use the word bloodbath, but he says he's speaking uh, metaphorically. But it's a template for what really did happen four years later. And I, I recommend people take a look at that. All right. So let's zoom out for a minute and imagine how these two stories, the Proud Boys story and the Oath Keepers story, figure into the larger picture of the big lie and the January 6th event. What you're saying, it seems to me, is that these are people who are substantially and pervasively animated by a kind of catastrophizing version of who Joe Biden is and the big lie, who are, in the case of the Oath Keepers, operating on this sort of fantastical idea that they're going to be called up as the president's militia, in the case of the Proud Boys, who don't even care, who are just preparing for not just violence, but preparing to be the kind of vanguard of animating the the masses, right? The, a few people can get 700 or a few thousand people to invade the Capitol. And without which the event itself does not or may not happen, at least not as we have understood it. I guess my question is, how does this, in your judgment, fit into the larger story that we've all been thinking about for the last year? Well, the big lie, you know, is it's absolutely essential to everything, to setting this stage. And then the Oath Keepers, you know, have, a, have always had an exceedingly paranoid mindset. They were created in 2009, 
shortly after President Obama took over. And the premise really was that the U.S. government had been subverted by globalists and socialists and communists, and the government was going to not just come for Americans' guns, although that was really, uh, that was the primary fear. It was also going to issue these other orders and maybe even put them in concentration camps, put Americans in concentration. It was going to blockade cities. And and so the Oath Keepers take an oath not to obey these a series of orders, including or, orders like I just described. It's, it's really amazing stuff. And, the blockading cities order. Yeah, yeah. Because that's, that's really likely to happen. Yeah. And, and and actually, it's sort of ironic. One of the orders they're not supposed to carry out uh, is uh, an order to impose martial law. Now, obviously, after Trump takes over, something shifts in the Oath Keeper worldview and uh, martial law or invocation of the Insurrection Act becomes the great desideratum. And especially as the 2020 election approaches. And, and even before it has arrived, there's, there's already talk about civil war and Biden being a Chinese puppet. And, there's, and he's also, you know, Stuart Rhodes goes frequently on the Alex Jones show. He's a frequent guest there. Uh, there is some QAnon-like stuff about pedophiles. And he, he wants a big, you know, the Trump to have a big data dump that will expose all the pedophiles in government. Uh, so he says he's afraid there's going to be a Benghazi style attack on the White House on election eve. I mean, it is it's pretty out there. Uh, anyway, that uh, that that worldview carries carries forward through the November Million MAGA march and then the December. 14th March, and then finally the January 6th March. So what are your big takeaways from all this? You have, you've spent way more time than any human should in the, <laughs> uh, in the minds of Proud Boys and Oath Keepers and thinking through what evidence the government has. Uh, what do you take away from it? I was very surprised at the importance of the Proud Boys' role, uh, you know, again, I, I'm assuming the accuracy of these indictments and uh, the allegations, but it sounds like they really got this going. And then the Oath Keepers, uh, who were waiting for a signal and becoming, they were frustrated. Uh, Rhodes talks about being frustrated by Pence not doing anything, and he's, he's, he's even frustrated with Trump, that Trump is just whining, he's not acting, the patriots are going to have to take it into their own hands. And then, you know, about a half hour after Pozzola breaks out the window on the east side, 14 uh, Oath Keepers are with the crowd that forces their way through the doors on the east side. And uh, they have famously, they have scaled the eastern steps in stack formation, this uh, remarkable military formation where each each person has their hand on the shoulder of the cadre in front of them, and they're all dressed in, you know, tactical gear and, and helmets and goggles and, and boots and uh, that extraordinary symbol of uh, the audacity of, of the insurrection. So in both of these cases, a few of the defendants have pled out and are reportedly cooperating. Uh, What do we know about the status of these cases and the cooperation level of the individuals who have pled and are working with the government? So the Oath Keeper indictment has involved over time, 21 defendants, uh, named defendants. It also has about five or six unindicted co-conspirators. And of the 21 named, four have pleaded guilty and are have signed cooperation agreements, pledging full cooperation. That case is currently set to go to trial April 19th, I think. It's certainly in April. And uh, the 
Proud Boys cases are more splintered, maybe reflecting, possibly f reflecting Terrio's instructions that they should work in small teams and that they should blend in and they should not wear colors. Um, but there are four conspiracy indictments involving 15 people and I mean, a total of 15. And there are, then there are probably at least a dozen individual Proud Boys who've just been charged, not as conspirators, but just for violence that uh, occurred that day. And I don't think any of those cases are scheduled yet. One person who was with them uh, is scheduled to go to trial this uh, in February, Robert Gieswine. He's He's not alleged to be a Proud Boy, but he did seem to line up with them in the crowd. He's he's affiliated, said to be allegedly affiliated with three, three percenters, which is another far right wing militia group. And he had a baseball bat. Uh, he's charged with uh, using a bear spray and uh, a baseball bat against officers. He's supposed to go to trial. But that is not really a Proud Boys case. We are going to leave it there. Roger Parloff, thank you for your work on this, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer this episode is Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. You need to do your part to promote the Lawfare Podcast. The most important thing you can do is to go to patreon.com slash lawfare and become a material supporter of the site. The Lawfare Podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is performed by the one, the only, Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening.